Greetings, my name is Thomas Beale. I'm the CTO of Version Informatics and one of the architects of OpenAir. This is the part one introduction of the ADO 1.5 course. Just to put ourselves in perspective, uh, this part will look at the requirements, it'll look at some key big picture uh, viewpoints to do with archetypes, and we'll just summarize the current status and usage of the ADL formalism. So let's go and have a look at the requirements. You need to think about the ultimate goals that we're trying to achieve. Why would we bother doing something as complicated as multi-level modeling, archetypes, templates, terminology and so on? Well there are three areas that uh, we can try and achieve something new in. One of them is what we can call traceability. It means being able to actually connect requirements in some technical way to the final engineered system. Now in current ICT we tend to assume that this is almost impossible. In, in some sense uh, we've, we've given up a little bit on being able to actually have requirements well connected to the final engineered system and we assume that getting the final engineered system involves numerous iterations to actually get it right. Here we're going to try and do something different. We're going to try and connect domain experts seamlessly to the software rather than going through complicated requirements, interview uh, methodology and so on. We're going to give domain experts tools which enables them to author something directly and it means that software developers are given something that they can use the output of those tools. Another thematic area in which we can think about uh, as a goal is to do with systems. We need to be able to make back-end systems large data processing uh, systems and services as immune as, Im as possible to changes in content uh, and changes in requirements. That's also an old need and it's one that still isn't generally satisfied very, sa very well in uh, normal mainstream ICT. Another key area is data. What do we want to do with data? Well, once it's been captured we want to use it and reuse it. That means querying it. One of the goals, therefore, that we want to achieve is being able to really use data. And that means being able to do something that isn't common in current ICT. That is, build queries once and build them based on model semantics rather than physical storage schemas. We can think of meeting these goals in terms of modeling. Everything that we're trying to do leading up to building systems and creating data is some kind of modeling. The first thing we can think about is levels of semantic definition. We're sort of inherently claiming that just building a reference model that is an information model or a single uh, database schema isn't sufficient. It's obviously needed because otherwise you can't have any data. Uh, or software objects. Those are the basics of computing. But if we want to move above that, then we have to think about what types, what levels of, of semantics we want in uh, our modeling environment. So the first level above the reference model is what we can think of as data points and groups. That is an agreed notion, an agreed model for something like blood sugar or date of diagnosis. Uh, these are typical data points that would be found in health data models. A group of data points for recording pain or symptoms. Uh, also laboratory results tend to come in groups. So that's data points or groups. These are things that don't change uh, depending on where they're used. Blood sugar always has the same meaning. Date of diagnosis has the same meaning everywhere. The next level we need to consider is use case specific data sets, that is, collections of data points and data groups that correspond to particular situations, such as a first visit for a diabetic patient or an HbA1c lab report. 
these data sets correspond to a type of a patient, a type of situation such as a type of clinic, a type of carer, uh, in general some specific kind of health system business event. The next level we can think about is implementation specificity, that is expressions of the models in terms of forms for user interfaces, message definitions for uh, communication between systems, document definitions, uh, different types of communication between systems. So we're talking about technology specific uh, expressions of these models, these data sets made up of data points and data groups. Another thing we need to think about is the fractal nature of data. We always think we know today what amount, what detail level of data we want. We never do. And no matter how hard we try, we'll never get it right, even if we expend a lot of energy on a very uh, deep requirement analysis effort. So what we need to be able to do is instead have some sort of model evolution possibility. You can see at the bottom there, typical idea of fractal data. The data points on the left show a pretty reasonable, simple set of data points that would take care of most recordings of diagnosis. But you can see it quickly evolves into uh, a numerous data points and those uh, more detailed expressions of the information simply come about by more analysis, particular types of use, particular uh, use cases or user types. The models of the of the information in those various semantic layers uh, that we mentioned just before need to be connected to terminology to enable sharing and inferencing. Sharing because parties that share the same terminology can agree that something that's marked as systolic blood pressure is indeed the same thing. Inferencing is the use of terminology to compare data to a knowledge base, for example to find patients that have some kind of heart disease based on particular types of heart disease that are recorded in each patient record. Now another fact of life is that coverage by terminology of all of the possible data points information uh, in the clinical world is only partial. So something we're going to need to do is have an explicit notion of binding between terminology and models of content. Something that's very important is that content definitions are going to have to be able to involve, evolve over time without invalidating the existing data. In the clinical world, data is really what it's all about. Data is the most important asset and data is what there is a lot of. So we know that with uh, requirements changing quite often and in, in various different ways to do with different workflows, different types of test results, uh, different new medical science requirements are always changing and yet very large amounts of data are continually being created. So our modelling environment that we want to build has to ensure that the data created by previous versions of the model models uh, is still valid and that it can be queried effectively. So that means we're going to have to track the relationship between older versions of content models and newer ones. Content definitions need to be localizable. It's no good if you have a model environment where you can obtain models that work only in a, a purely standardized international sense but you can't do anything to them. What if you need to add an extra data point? What if you need to refine the uh, terminology subset that's specified on a particular data point? So we need a mechanism for model refinement, refinement of existing models 
somewhat like in object oriented programming. We always need to remember that the health record needs to store structured data that can be re reliably queried in unexpected ways later on. We never really know all of the uses that the data are going to be put to, not even necessarily for point of care for the uh, patient in their current stay. It can very easily be the case that a new piece of software is deployed and starts querying the data in an unexpected way uh, two days after the patient arrives. So the requirement here is that the semantics of the data must not change with respect to querying and ideally we should be able to uh, maintain the semantics of the data uh, over a period of years or even decades. This means that uh, even if the data are moved to different physical storage and, and it, that is guaranteed to happen also to different application systems the meaning of the data and the querying must still behave uh, it must still be the same. Similarly on the other side the queries themselves are an important asset they're expensive to produce in realistic environments and what we want is queries whose meaning doesn't change over time. Let's consider requirements to do with systems. Large EHR and other clinical information systems contain very large amounts of data in general. The kind of environment and technology we therefore need is one such that changes to models of content or new models of content and process workflows can't be allowed to affect the physical storage or database schemas. In today's technology it would uh, but because the technology isn't good enough to absorb the changes, what tends to happen is that as requirements keep changing, the system remains more or less the same with a much slower rate of changes being made and eventually the divergence between the system and the current requirements is so great that a new system needs to be deployed. We are looking at a whole different type of technology here. What we can think of as deploy once technology we can put it in place. It knows its information models, but uh, it's able to absorb models of content and process on top of that and just to continue functioning. In heterogeneous environments, there are going to be numerous vendor products. We need to have stability in the information models. That means that we, all of those products can aim for uh, something that uh, is, is the same across all of the products and enables them to share data at a basic level. We need to have flexibility in adoption of content models. That means that we can bring new models of content in at whatever rate and according to whatever plan makes sense. So ultimately what we're talking about here is adaptive systems. The archetype approach tries to address these areas. It assumes a stable information model. It enables domain level models to be built on top. Data points and groups which we call archetypes. Use case based data sets which we call templates. Terminology binding. Provides mechanisms for reuse and localization which includes specialization which is something like inheritance and slots which are how we join archetypes together and build up larger archetypes. It provides revisioning and versioning so that's how it takes care of uh, changes to content model definitions and existing data and not invalidating existing data. And it seamlessly connects domain experts to software developers by a tool chain. That gives us the traceability that we talked about earlier. Let's have a look at the big picture. We know that in the environment, uh, the notional environment, we have something called a reference model, that is a, a basic information model, a model of, of the actual concrete data. We have terminology, uh, things like SNOMED, ICD, 
and all the other well-known terminologies uh, that are used around the world. The first thing we introduce is archetypes as a level of modelling above the reference model, data points and data groups. With archetypes we can add bindings already to terminology and particularly to ref sets, that is subsets based on terminology. We can then define the level of modelling we, we call templates on top of archetypes. Similar to archetypes, templates can have bindings to terminology as well. In fact, they're likely to have more bindings because they tend to be more specialised and the particular uses of terminology are generally much better known in localised environments rather than for international or very general archetypes. From templates we build something called an operational template which we'll explain uh, in, the, in due course. From the operational template we build useful downstream products, programming language APIs, XML schemas, UI forms and all kinds of other artifacts that can be used. XML schemas are, come in lots of different flavours. A very typical uh, use of them is for message definitions, also for document definitions. These concrete expressions of uh, the templates that have been built are what give us data in the end. So we need to be able to connect queries to the data. That means that queries also form part of the overall model ecosystem. This ecosystem, you can see the connections between the reference model, archetypes, terminology, all the way through to definitions of documents, messages and other deployable artifacts. Let's look at it from the large-scale engineering systems point of view. What this diagram shows is the key categories of tools and systems services components that are going to be needed in an archetype based uh, in an archetype based world. The right hand side, if we just looked at the right hand side only, that corresponds to the types of things we expect to see in normal software engineering environments. Some sort of application development tool you see on the top right there and the things that are built by developers using tools, applications, services and back-end uh, systems and services, EHR, demographics, terminology and so on. What we're adding in is the, the technology on the left, the tools to do modelling, building archetypes, templates, building subsets, building queries based on those models uh, and also technology for storing, but not just storing models, for interrogating, that means querying in an intelligent way, uh, being able to locate models that do certain things to know if we need to build a new model or simply reuse an, an existing model. Uh, all kind of publishing uh, functions as well. So what's on the left hand side uh, is new technology and it radically changes what's on the right hand side because all levels of the technology that we produce and also the application building tools are essentially programmed by operational templates terminology ref sets coming from the model definition environment on the left. I'll just make a, a few background points about the formalism before we actually get into the what does the formalism look like. We need to just get a bit of a picture of how it works with respect to tools. First of all, the ADL formalism, archetype definition language, it's like any other formalism. An ADL artifact is uh, 
logically an instance of the ADL uh, language. So we can think of a relationship of language syntax conformance, just like a programming language like Java or, or C Sharp. Uh, an actual class file is an instance of the definition of that language. We can parse archetypes. If we do that, we'll get an in-memory uh, object form of the archetype. That is something like an abstract syntax tree or AST. The main point is that it's uh, objects in memory rather than a serial form. Those objects conform to what we can think of as the object form of ADL. We call this the archetype object model or AOM and uh, for many people this is probably slightly easy to understand. It's the relationship of objects that is instances uh, conforming to a, a model typically expressed in UML which of course the AOM is. We can serialize an archetype into back into ADL by the normal means that is traversing the in-memory tree and generating back out ADL syntax. However, we can serialize it into something else, for example an XML form of ADL via a different type of serializer. If we do that we get XML flavored archetypes. Clearly we need a parser for those and you can see there from the right hand side that the object form of archetypes can be completely serialized and regenerated from XML archetypes. Those XML archetypes uh, conform to an XML form of the AOM, so we can think of this as the AOM XML schema. Now, parsing models isn't the only way to build the in-memory form of an archetype. Of course, we can build a tool with a graphical interface that provides functions for building in memory uh, the object form of archetypes. They can then be serialized out into whatever form as a, a means of persisting archetypes. So the core of the of the picture and the the most important element is that object form of archetypes and therefore the most important formalism is the archetype object model in terms of engineering. However, all formalisms need a syntax that humans can read that enables the original development so that the developers can discuss and uh, evolve the formalism. It enables the formalism, formalism to be documented. It enables education to take place. So ADLs, one of the key roles of ADL is to actually perform this role for the archetype formalism. So if we go back to the previous slide you can think of the archetype formalism as, as both ADL and the AOM. But the AOM is an object model of uh, instances and it's hard to understand in a, a sort of textbook or educational sense, whereas we can get exactly the same syntax, exactly the same semantics from the ADL syntax uh, and therefore that's, that's one of the reasons why it's so useful. It's also a normative syntax. That's because, if you think again on this diagram, it, it's uh, easy to have different variants of XML as output serializations. And the reason for that is some, some types of XML are optimized for space, that is, less XML uh, statements. Some types of XML are optimized for speed of processing uh, and so on. So ADL provides a, a normative syntax. It's abstract. It's not expressed in terms of any other syntax. So it's a bit like a programming language or the uh, web ontology language OWL. One question that many people have is, do I have to use ADL? I like to use XML or I like to use JSON or I like to use YAML or 
my own fantastic archetype syntax. Why can't I use those? Well, in fact you can. There's absolutely no reason why not. As long as you've got tools and operational systems that support that syntax, then there's absolutely no reason not to use it. And the XML form of archetypes has been in use for uh, nearly a decade. Some of the other forms, JSON, YAML, etc., are probably going to come into use uh, with more recent technologies and they have initial support already in ADO 1.5. As I said before, the AOM structures are what matters, but it helps if you can read ADL because that makes it easy to understand the specifications, it makes it easy to uh, explain small fragments of constraints to other people. So the current status of ADL and the AOM is uh, late draft in the 1.5 version. You can see at the top of the page there that ADL and AOM 1.4 uh, snapshots were donated to SEN TC251 in 2007 and they've since become an ISO standard which is 13606 part 2. The, in that standard the AOM part is considered the normative part and ADL is an informative annex. You can see two uh, useful resources below ADL and AOM 1.5 there. The home page uh, on the wiki contains all of the uh, information that uh, relates to changes that have been made, uh, ongoing development work. The second link is the ADL workbench, which is an implementation of uh, the ADL and AOM formalisms. This page shows uh, the OpenAI wiki, and if you type in ADL 1.5, first hit is the home page, whose link was just on the previous slide there. And this page just has all of the information about the development that's going on. You can see a summary of changes table there. Uh, there's about 40 things that have been added or changed compared to ADL and AOM 1.4. They're listed there and there's a detailed description of what's been done. This shows the ADL Workbench homepage uh, where you can download the tool for a number of platforms and also uh, there's a bunch of tutorials available on YouTube to understand just how to use the tool. So that's it for the first episode. Here's the uh, contents of the next chapter, ADL Basics, and we'll be looking at an example and just the pieces of how uh, a normal archetype fits together, just so that we can get a feel for it. I hope this has been useful, and I look forward to having you for the next instalment. Thank you.